going to call this meeting to order for the City of Iowa City Council meeting on September 20th, 2022. It is just 6 o'clock, and I'm going to call it to order. Roll call, please. Alter? Here. Burgess? Here. Harmson? Here. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. Weiner? Here. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to your city hall. Super excited that you're here today. Um, we are on to item number two, which is proclamations. 2A is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and this will be read by Mayor Pro Tem Alter. Whereas domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking affects women, children, and men of all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds, causing long-term physical, psychological, and emotional harm, and whereas one in three Americans have witnessed an incident of domestic violence, and whereas children who experience domestic violence are at a higher risk for failure in school, mental illness, substance abuse, suicide, and may choose violence as a way to solve problems later in life. And whereas domestic violence in rural communities exists as a hidden, silent, and un often unrecognized crime that is often underreported, and whereas through the inspiration, courage, and persistence of victims of domestic violence, their children, and advocates, our communities are learning to recognize the impact of violence in the home and intimate relationships. And whereas the Domestic Violence Intervention Program has worked to end violence in intimate relationships for more than 40 years through the collaborative partnerships of advocates, volunteers, local municipalities, criminal justice, health and human services, faith communities, business leaders, and private citizens. And whereas our community's achievements should be commended and we must continue our commitment to respect and support victims of domestic violence and to prevent future violence in our community. Now, therefore, I, Megan Alter, Mayor Pro Tem, on behalf of Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2022 to be Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Iowa, Iowa City, and urge all community members to work together to eliminate domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking from our community. And here to accept is Christy Dozer with DBIP. We have a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Please. I'm Christy Dozer, I'm with the Domestic Violence Intervention Program and I wanna introduce a colleague of mine, Caroline. Um, we are here to talk a little bit about October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I've got some stuff that they're passing forward, thank you. DVIP, I mean, I've gotten the honor and pleasure of talking with so many of you about um, victim services in Johnson County and specifically in Iowa City. And I wanna take a minute just to say thank you again. I've worked in this field now, <laughs> the white hair, if that doesn't date me, I don't know what does, mm. but <laughs> I've worked in this field since the middle 80s and have had the honor to um, work with so many amazing people across the state. And one of the things I know to be true is that the community of Iowa City uh, and Johnson County are truly, truly supporters of victims of domestic violence. The support that you give us both fiscally, but much more importantly, through your um, words and efforts, um, really do send a message across not only our community, but across the entire state about what's needed for victim survivors. You've heard me say this before, what would it take to keep you safe from the one person that knows everything about you? What would that look like? How challenging would that be? How terrifying would that be? <laughs> and we want you to know how much we appreciate your support and how much your efforts um, have an impact. This last year, we saw another increase in the services that we provided, a little over 10%. We served a little over 2,400 uh, adults and youth uh, in our eight county service area. In Jansen County specifically, and in Iowa City, Iowa City, we served a little over 1,000 individuals. And in Johnson County, we served a total of 1,486. And so I don't have the numbers memorized yet, it's too soon. <laughs> we just finished up in July. Um, so what I want you to 
to know is that these numbers, unfortunately, are not going down. The resources for victims of domestic violence need to remain constant and improve. Um, obviously, we're struggling with the same things that families are in general. The increase in costs, the increase in um, wait times for resources, and just finding the safety and dignity that victims deserve. And so I just wanted to say thank you. And I really want to find out if you have questions, because you guys heard me talk a lot. <laughs> so. Well, what I'll tell you is we really appreciate you being here today and all of the work that you all do at DVIP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. All right. All righty. Since we receive materials, could I get a motion um, to receive correspondence? So move, Taylor. Second, Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. We are at Proclamation um, 2B, National Hisp Hispanic Heritage Month. And this is, uh, it says, whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is an opportunity to recognize the contributions of Hispanic Americans and to celebrate Hispanic heri heritage and culture. And whereas each year the federal government and local governments observe National Hispanic Heritage Month as the period from September 15th to October 15th, by recognizing and celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas September 15th is significant as a starting date for Hispanic Heritage Month because it is the anniversary of Independence Day for the Latin American communities, uh, Latin American countries of Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, in addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their independence on September 16th and September 18th, respectfully. And whereas Latinx have made innumerable contributions to the Iowa City community, and it is important the city recognize and celebrate the diverse histories and cultures of the Latinx population, and whereas the Latinx community is integral to our city, with business owners and residents alike who are proud to be a part of the Latinx community, but hope for greater visibility, recognition, and representation. And whereas the city of Iowa City continually strive to foster mutual understanding and respect among all persons, and whereas this observance affords special opportunities to become more knowledgeable about Hispanic heritage and to honor the many Hispanics who have contributed to the progress of Iowa City, the state, and the nation. Now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim September 15, 2022 through October 15, 2022 to be National Hispanic Heritage Month. And to receive this is going to be Marcella, Elizabeth, and Manny. My name is Marcela Hurtado. I live in Iowa City. Um, I'm from Mexico. This is a big step for the community Hispanic. Only say thank you very much. My name is Marcela Hurtado. Uh, my name is Marcela Hurtado. I live in Iowa City. And um, I am from Mexico. And this is a big step for the Latino community. And all I want to say is thank you so much. Great. Great. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. And uh, I just want to say, I'm agree with Marcela. This is a huge for us to be a proclamation in Iowa City. Uh, we're learning too much from each other, so thank you so much for today. Uh, just come and celebrate our culture with us, please. Thank you. Great. Yeah. 
I literally just made it. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to say that I'm so happy uh, for this proclamation that it has aligned with the Johnson County. So Johnson County also put out a proclamation. And at the state level, the governor also put out a proclamation. Um, we just had, uh, I think that this year we had the most highest outcome in just participation throughout Latino festivals across the state of Iowa as well. So that's growing. Um, so. All of these things come together just to show you that the population here is getting rooted, it's not going anywhere, and it's just a beautiful way to show the past, current, and future contributions of the Latino people in the state of Iowa, um, and it's just a very beautiful thing. Uh, it's also nothing that it's new. I do want to say that uh, here at the University of Iowa at the archives, uh, there's a beautiful collection called Migration is Beautiful, and they did the great job of finding many families across the state of Iowa who have roots here for we're talking over 100 years, um, and documentation, um, uh, curating all this information about experiences of Latinos in the state of Iowa for a really long time. Uh, so you all should check that out. It's a beautiful thing. And I'm just very happy that um, all of this has been coinciding this year. Great. Thank you all. I just want to do some um, to, to my friends. And my name is Manny Galvez. I want to say thank you uh, to the city, to the people that live in this city. As always, I say, like uh, Iowa City can be an example for the rest of the state. Uh, as they mentioned, oh, this is important. The, uh, we know like uh, we have been here in Iowa for more than 100 years. And this is, uh, I would say, like uh, the second time like uh, we received this recognition in public. And that is a motivation to keep working for everybody in the Johnson County and Iowa City as well. And the most important, we are the, the, the majority minority, and the biggest minority, but we are the most underrepresented in the, in the Johnson County. So we have many things to work together. I think like when we work uh, for the Latino community, we are working from the city, and we are working for the Johnson County and from the state. And we are so proud to be this from this process and the history of the state of Iowa. Thank you. Thank you all. Great. All right. We're going to move on to our consent agenda, which is items three through seven. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move, Taylor. Second, second. Weiner. Move by Taylor, seconded by Weiner. Anyone from the public like to address <laughs> any item that is on the consent agenda? And is there anyone that wants to comment on item 6D, the Lakeshore Drive traffic calming? Seeing no one. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion f uh, to accept correspondence for item 6D? So moved, Burgess. Second, Taylor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. We are on to item number eight, which is our community comment. Um, I'll open up the community comment for three minutes up until uh, 7 p.m. at the latest, but we'll end before that if we get through all the commenters. Uh, if you are online, I'll ask that you raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Um, in person, there is a sign-up sheet that you can do a sticker at the back and also a sign-up at the desk if you want to write your name, but there is a basket for you to put your sticker in. And I'm going to welcome our first commenter. It's been a while. Welcome. Hey. Uh Thank you for uh, having public uh, speak. Uh, appreciate uh, the work we've done with uh, with, with our people who have come over from Central and South America. I um, I do want to bring up that uh, the U.S. Uh, has accepted. Well, the U.S. has accepted only 127 refugees from Afghanistan out of 60. 5,000 or so um, applications, which I think is, uh, is something we can do better on uh, and something I don't know if the city has any, any say or uh, can do anything in this, but it's a good thing to mention. Will you mention your name in the city where you live, please? Yeah, Brandon Ross. Uh, I live in Iowa City. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would also like to uh, bring up that uh, according 
to the doomsday clock people, we're only a minute away from doomsday. According to nuclear danger from nuclear war, uh, and um, that one of the reasons that we're in this, or the reason why we're in this, is because the United States and Russia are in a proxy war using Ukraine as their playground to do this. Um, I would like to say that uh, that in Ukraine, uh, about a third of the people in Ukraine are Russian. A third of the Ukrainians are also pro-Russia. And the two-thirds of the remaining Ukrainians are not anti-Russian. This is important to remember. There is a group that's anti-Russian, but it's, it's a right-wing nationalist group in the west of Ukraine. This group was supported by the United States in 2014 at the beginning of the Civil War in Ukraine, over which period about 20,000 people died uh, from 2014 to 2022 when Russia uh, got involved. Um, I think it's important if you want to save, if we want to save uh, lives, not only Afghanis and people in the world otherwise, but we want to reduce the danger from the nuclear doomsday clock, that we should be on the phone and writing emails to our Congress people in the White House to please stop saying that negotiations are off the table. Please negotiate and pull out the arms from Ukraine. Thank you. Anyone else like to address a topic that is not on our agenda? Welcome. Please state your name and the city you're from. My name is Joseph Purry. I'm from Williamsburg, Iowa, but I am from here, 1978. I'm in Williamsburg to take care of my sickly mom. Anyway, I just want to say uh, how wonderful it is to be here at this grand little pulpit here. And uh, it's really funny. When I was a boy, I wanted hair like other people. You know, I, I didn't like my hair. I wanted hair that was soft and wavy and laid down and... Someone told me recently, you know, I got just as beautiful hair as anybody else. Y'all touch your hair, you know, feel your hair. There ain't nothing wrong with your hair. Your hair is just as beautiful as any person on this planet, born or unborn. And I love all of you people. I love every single one of you. All you immigrants coming to my hometown, welcome to America. And I hope that you can enjoy the civil rights that I grew up with. When I come back here 30, 40 years later, I see a bunch of skyscrapers going up in the sky, a bunch of glass going all around. So what's going on here? <clears throat> well, I don't know what's going on here, but there's got to be a better way, a, a more peaceful way. I would like to be back in the farmer's market. I'm getting segregated from the people that I love. I am a local and I love all the local people, and I want to show them the beauty of my cabinetry, my carpentry. I don't think it's right to be segregating me from the people I love. It's not cool. So let's all just put your computers away, put your phones away, put your UNESCO computer away, and let's start speaking from the heart. What's going to be the best for our local people, our, love, our, our local people who love all these immigrants coming from everywhere else? I want you to enjoy America. I want you to enjoy the civil rights and the freedoms that we have. I want you to enjoy the Constitution of the United States of America. I want you all to enjoy the gifts that I have received, not from Iowa City. <clears throat> Iowa City has been rather rough on me my whole life. Uh, but, you know, let's all just get together and let's put away your phones and forget about UNESCO for a while and let's think about Iowa City and how we can love each other and improve each other. 
I go downtown, I, I'm, I'm in my, my south side neighborhood, I see black, white, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, Chinese, and the ones that know me, what's up, Joe? Hey, man, what's up, bro? I love you too, man. All right. Let's all be peaceful. I got a carving for you. It says peace on it. I can do it in Arabic too. Thank you. Anyone else like to address a topic that is not on our agenda? Seeing no one in present or online, I'm going to go to item number nine, which is 9A, rezoning Cardinal Heights. Ordinance conditionally rezoned in approximately 27.68 acres of property located east of Camp Cardinal Boulevard and west of Camp Cardinal Road from Interim Development Research Park zone to low density multifamily zone with a planned development overlay. This is second consideration. Could I get a motion to give second consideration, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Alter. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please come forth. Seeing no one, council discussion. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Please. I'm sorry. One second before we start that. Discuss our opinion on this now? Or? Yes, this is council discussion. Okay. Go All right. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Council sorry. discussion. Sorry to interrupt, Mayor, but I just had a few things uh, to say, and especially since I, I was in the, neg the only negative uh, with the previous vote, I, I want to thank uh, the city staff and the staff of Navigate and the many community members that uh, we that have taken the time to express their thoughts on this development. Uh, and first, I will say that I am in favor of growth and development, but the question is, at, at what cost should this come? And I, I, I'm not referring to monetary, but uh, primarily its effect on the surrounding environment. And we as a city have uh, continually uh, prided ourselves in protecting the environment and woodlands, so this particular rezoning request is kind of confusing to me as a council person. Uh, this development does check a lot of the boxes as far as the requirements and looks to be a nice development. Uh, I like the fact that there is a um, variety, a nice mix of, of housing uh, types uh, that blend in with the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, however, it's generated a lot of concerns for me. And as council members, uh, we should keep in mind any comments that come from our community members when making decisions. Uh, a number of concerns were raised uh, by neighboring community members, and, and it wasn't just on NIMBY. They had some very valid concerns, uh, including um, possible erosion as far as along the uh, creek line there, uh, stormwater drainage and runoff, destruction of the woodlands, uh, sensitive areas and slopes, and protection of endangered species. Um, specifically, there was some note in there about Indiana bat that was mentioned and questioned at some point in time, and I didn't see any further information on that as far as where we are with, uh, with that. Um, other concerns that came to me included the fact that this area is not serviced by public transportation. Um, in the information provided, the project is uh, referred to as walkable. And of course, it is in line with uh, many nearby trails, but not such things as groceries and retail centers or banks. Uh, the term affordable came up a few times in the information. And this, uh, I'm, being a West Sider, I'm very well aware that this section of the West Side of Iowa City is not known for affordability. So I'm not sure what population they are intending for this development. Um, are, and I, I question if we're in such uh, crucial need of new development that we have to uh, squeeze in developments into every piece of existing green space and growth of trees that we have in the area. Why can't we um, balance somehow the need for increased housing with environmental protection? So I would ask the developer uh, and my fellow council members to consider these things before proceeding with approval for this development. That's all, sorry. No worries. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? No. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Item number 9B is rezoning 518 Bowery Street. 
ordinance conditionally rezoned on approximately 1,470 square feet, a property located at 518 Bowery Street from high-density multifamily, residential zone with a historic district overlay, to neighborhood commercial zone with a historic district overlay. Staff is requesting expedited action. Could I get a um, motion, please? I move <clears throat> that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to finally pa be passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second, Taylor. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Taylor. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? And I see no one online. Council discussion? I just reiterate that I love seeing yep. that this historic building uh, is going to get a life as a coffee shop in an area where there's a lot of students and there are no coffee shops nearby. And so I think this is going to be really welcome. And, um, you know, it just seems it, the, the perfect fit for the area and uh, the size of the building. So I'm excited to see what happens. Three. Ditto, ditto. Mm -hmm. All right, roll call please. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passed, a seven to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved, Weiner. Second, second Taylor. Thomas. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Thomas. Roll Taylor. call. Taylor. Oh, Taylor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> roll call please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes seven to uh, zero. We are on to item number 9C, which is Monument Hills prim, uh, Preliminary Plat and Preliminary Sensitive Areas Development Plan. This is a resolution approving the preliminary plat and prelim, pre, preliminary sensitive areas development plan of the Monument Hills subdivision, Iowa City, Iowa. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So, so move, Thomas. Second, Alter. All right, and we're going to welcome Danielle. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Danielle Sitzman, Neighborhood and Development Services. As you introduced tonight, this is an application for a preliminary plat on behalf of uh, Monument Farms LLC and Joe Clark of Monument Hills LLC, requesting a preliminary plat for approximately 70 acres um, just west of Scott Boulevard and north of Rochester Avenue. This would facilitate the eventual construction of single, 64 single-family detached residences, 12 senior single-family units, three duplexes, and 20 a 29 unit senior multifamily apartment uh, shown here bounded in the white outline. Just for reference, this is an exhibit from the rezoning kind of showing the existing neighborhood. As I mentioned, um, this particular lot's ownership just bounded to the north is the Harvest Preserve ownership uh, and, an, and an existing subdivision to the west off of Large Lane and as well as some recent development along Tamarack Ridge that you may be uh, familiar with. This shows the rezoning action that was recently approved for the rezoning to low density single family with the OPD or planned development overlay on it. Um, this occurred in two different uh, actions or two different blends of zoning because part of this area was being preserved as the interim development zone that it already was, just overlaying the OPD over on top of it. That was to accommodate an existing communications tower. Um, so there was an OPD rezoning, including a preliminary sensitive areas development plan for these areas. This is the plat that's under consideration tonight. And just to orient a little bit, you can see uh, the extension of new public streets off of Rochester in a loop, uh, several loops off of those. There is also a private uh, street loop on the northeast, well, I guess southeast corner of this development um, to facilitate the senior housing, the mix of housing types that I mentioned. Um, there are some lots being preserved, as I mentioned, for an existing uh, communications tower as well as an existing home off of Rochester. There's also a trail connection on the northwest corner of this plat uh, to Calder Park, and then some right-of-way dedication happening at the intersection of Scott Boulevard and Rochester. Uh, there is an outlot E uh, included in this plat that was not uh, discussed much with the uh, rezoning since it was not subject to the rezoning, but it is part of this platting. It is where the trail connects to um, Calder Park. There are sensitive areas included in this area as well, so there's an, a revised preliminary sensitive areas development plan tonight. 
Uh, as part of a subdivision review, we look at several uh, criteria, including the comprehensive plan, as well as any conditions that might have been attached to the previous rezoning act action, and then a review of subdivision code standards. So in regards to uh, uh, applicability to the comprehensive plan, as was discussed at the rezoning, this area of um, the city is identified as appropriate for conservation design. Um, developments with a conservation design should be more compact with less pavement overall, and therefore preserving more open space in, uh, than a conventional development. Um, the project area is approximately 65 to 70 acres, half of which will remain undeveloped. Uh, with conservation easements over them to preserve and protect those sensitive features. Therefore, it's consistent with our comprehensive plan in general. And then also a review of the Northeast District Plan, uh, which is also uh, in place in this area. Uh, the proposed development generally aligns with that as well, um, which includes primarily single family development, concentrating more intense development at the corners of major intersections. As far as rezonings that were included, or conditions that were included in the rezoning, um, all of the ones that can, can be satisfied at this stage are, are essentially they all need to be um, completed with final plat, but we're tracking those as we go through. Um, they have to do with dedication of um, trail easements and public right of way, also um, incorporating traffic calming that's been shown. Um, so as we check the preliminary plat, we can see they're anticipating those de uh, dedications and leaving room for traffic calming. Uh, the criteria that we look at for preliminary plat um, standard subdivision standards, I'll just go through this briefly. As I mentioned, there are some public streets and private streets being developed, as well as a trail. Um, there's traffic calming involved in this plat as well, where the block length is a little bit longer than we would desire it to be. Um, so overall, this development encourages an interconnection of sidewalks and um, facilitates traffic calming. In regard to open space, they are required to dedicate or do fee and lieu for a certain amount of uh, public open space or parkland based on the overall size of the development. In this case, it's just over 1.38 acres of uh, land that would need to either be dedicated or, dedicated or uh, have a fee and lieu um, payment made. In this case, the applicant is required to pay a fee in lieu since they have not chosen to include a parkland dedication. Um, we had preferred originally that the outlet E be a parkland dedication. They declined to pursue that and in fact transferred the ownership um, to Harvest Preserve instead. Um, so we have required the trail connection, but that doesn't satisfy their open space requirements. So they will still have to do a, a fee in lieu. As far as utilities, um, there are adequate utilities available. They've made a plan for stormwater uh, uh, collection as well. So essentially, the preliminary plat satisfies the required subdivision requirements. So in the development steps, um, highlighted in green is the stage that we are here uh, tonight. Um, previously, the rezoning was accomplished uh, for that set of rezonings. Um, they will need to follow this up with the final plat and then an update or final version of the sensitive areas development plan with a site plan or final plat and then building permits. Um, they did hold a good neighbor meeting previously with the rezoning. So based on a review of the relevant criteria and subdivision code, staff did recommend approval with no additional conditions. As I mentioned, they held that uh, good neighbor meeting previously, and at September 7th, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also voted to recommend. I'm happy to answer questions. Do you have, <clears throat> do you have any idea how much the fee in lieu will be? Um, it's based on assessed value, so no, I don't. Um, we would take a look at that uh, based on the acreage that's required. I know that this is not part of the specific, but that um, at that four-way, is that going to also be affected? Is it going, I know that there are, are roundabouts planned along different, or in place along Scott, and it seems like that especially with this new development. Is that something that is in the works so I'm the, remembering? Um, sure, the amount of right-of-way that we require to be de dedicated at that corner could accommodate a roundabout in the future. So that was part of our analysis of what this may trigger. It's not required to be installed, though, with this development. Any um, thoughts on the schedule for the senior housing in the corner? No, I mean, that would be under a, a separate developer. Mm -hmm. um, so the sale of that lot, the finalization of that sale of that lot, and their uh, eventual um, site plan review would you know, need to happen before we could uh, tell you when that might be. Um, they have some steps to accomplish first, but 
Um, no, they haven't given us a schedule. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Anyone from the public like to, or we do have uh, the development team, do they have any comments that they want to add? Good evening, Mike Welch, Welch Design and Development on behalf of um, the applicant. Um, also, uh, Tracy from Ewing Development is here too, and so she can probably speak a little bit to those questions about the timing of the senior component on the corner. Um, I just wanted to kind of just do a quick highlight um, for you, just a reminder, the preliminary plat you see tonight is almost identical to the concept plan that we submitted with rezoning. Um, I think the things that have changed has been the, a little bit more detail on the trail and the alignment for that trail connection to Calder Park. Um, just a couple things to probably to highlight then, um, just based on other comments that we've received um, in the past. I guess that good neighbor meeting that we did hold, if you remember, um, we had some additional lots on Rochester Avenue that as a result of feedback from the neighbors, we removed those from the development. Um, so I do, I think that's just an important piece to remember that it was a, a very collaborative effort with the surrounding neighbors. And then the other piece to mention is that outlot B that's in conservation, that's kind of along Rochester Avenue, um, that's being preserved. And that is that area that was identified as kind of that, what I'd call like old growth woodlands, where it's been there for, you know, 100 years plus. And so we are preserving and, and keeping that set aside um, in addition to meeting code requirements for woodland preservation and all the other sensitive features that we have. Um, and then just a quick update on where we're at design-wise. We are working through the permitting process with the DNR and Corps of Engineers for the sewer crossing Ralston Creek and the trail on Ralston Creek. And so working through those, those processes as this goes on too. And then overall timing, um, pending approval of a preliminary plat, we're kind of ready to move in full to construction documents and then final plat trying to get this going as, as soon as possible. Um, within those requirements. So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Or like I said, I know Tracy can talk to you a little bit about Ewing's specific piece. Hi, um, my name is Tracy Anderson. I'm from Ewing Development, um, also Vintage Cooperatives. So we have 11 established um, cooperative communities in the state of Iowa, and we have five more under construction in Iowa and Missouri. Um, three of those are in Johnson County, Coralville, Iowa City, and North Liberty. So they've been very successful, and we look forward to hopefully a fourth location. Um, senior cooperatives are mem member owned and member governed. Um, our member owners are like-minded persons that uh, are looking for to spend their finer years in locations with access to arts and culture, excellent health care, and Iowa City is a perfect fit for that. Vintage cooperatives um, are unique because we excel at building communities, we offer personalized homes, and we always deliver um, a unique and individualized customer experience. So the borough, our project that we are proposing for Iowa City, will be the first of um, this product for vintage cooperatives that has a choice of three different home styles. So we have our estate homes, which are patio homes, we have our um, suites, which are condo style homes, and then the villas, which are the town or twin homes. Um, all in one location, there are several amenities and common areas, including a pickleball court and pool and fitness center. Um, so uh, our communities are maintenance free and they come with professional and experience management. Um, <coughs> And on behalf of Ewing Development, I thank you for your consideration and I welcome your questions about our community. <coughs> you mentioned that there's one, there are three existing and that there is already one in Iowa City. What's its name? That is Vintage Cooperative of Iowa City. That is a three-story building on Foster Road. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. All righty. Any other questions for staff or the developers? All right, gonna open this up to the public. Anyone wanna address this topic? There is no one online and there is no one present. Council discussion? Looks like what we were presented with before. Mm -hmm. Solid. I, I do appreciate the effort made in terms of uh, both communicating and relating the project to the larger context, you know, with the trail 
leading off toward Hickory Hill Trail and the, the reference, not in this presentation, but the last one to the comprehensive plan and the overlay which showed the relationship between the proposal and our comprehensive plan. So thank you for that. And I think listening to the community and making some adjustments is also good, so. All right, roll call please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10 is fiscal year 2023 budget amendment public hearing. Resolution amending the current budget for fiscal year ending June 2023. I'm gonna open the public hearing and I'm gonna welcome Nicole, our finance director. If I can find the presentation, there it is. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Good evening. Like Mayor said, Nicole Davies, Finance Director, and I'm here to just briefly go over our first budget amendment for the FY23. Just to have background, this is a budget that we just approved in March of 2022. It runs from July 1 of 22 to June 30th of 2023. Um, our policy allows for amendments in the following situations, emergent situations, transfers from contingency funds, expenditures that have offsetting revenues or using fund balance, and then carryover of prior year budget authority. This first amendment is almost entirely carryover of prior year budget authority, which is typically what this first budget amendment is. Um, we can amend any time other than the last 30 days of the fiscal year. We've typically, will run three budget amendments, um, one about this time every year of mostly carryovers. Then we'll amend, um, we'll have our second amendment along with the operating budget for the next fiscal year in March. And then we typically have a third amendment in May. Um, so like I said, the next planned amendment will be in March. Um, the carry forwards, those requests are submitted by the departments. They're reviewed by the city manager's office and also the finance department. Um, our budget policy states that they must be at least $5,000 or 1% of that division's budget. Um, we have a lot of capital improvement project budget carry forwards and that again is what makes up the majority of this budget amendment. Um, and the CIPs, they tend, tend to align more with the calendar year and we have a lot of multi-year projects. And then there's some other miscellaneous small amendments. Um, just to give the highlights of the revenues, um, the intergovernmental revenues, a little over 11 million. That's again, mostly state and federal grants that are for our CIP. Um, the other financing sources, that's mostly sales for the university and South District homes. And then the miscellaneous of 240 is uh, contributions again for those CIP. Uh, the expenditures, uh, the governmental capital projects is the largest at 36 million. Um, a few of those major CIP projects, the Melrose Avenue improvements, the Benton Street rehab, and then to the senior center building improvements. Uh, with the business type enterprise, that's about 17 million. Um, the two major projects there are the automated parking equipment and then the annual sewer projects. And then the community and economic development of about 21 million, that's mostly the ARPA um, carry forward for those funds to still be used. Um, so again, the first budget amendment, the overall impact to the fund balance is a decrease of about 65 million. Um, and that's covered through excess fund balance and bonds from for those projects. And this does not affect the property tax levies. Can I get a quick five million? Any questions? Thank you. All right, hearing no questions. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? I see no one online. Anyone present? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Harmson. Second, Taylor. All right, council discussion. It's just actually really helpful to understand what it is, why we're doing the amendment right now, and, and have the, those those sort of three different processes outlined. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Harmson. 
Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes, motion passes seven to zero. Item number 11 is 2022 traffic restriping. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the 2022 traffic restriping project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for a receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing and welcome Ethan. Yep. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm a civil engineer with the city of Iowa City. Um, so the 2022 traffic restriping project, uh, we're going to be doing Market Street and Jefferson Street. Uh, Market Street is going to be from Madison Street to Rochester Avenue and will be included uh, buffered bike lanes. Jefferson Street is going to be Clinton Street to Evans Street with a buffered bike lane. Uh, Keokuk Street is Sandusky Drive to Highway 6, and that will be just a bike lane with no buffer. Uh, Southgate Ave will be from South Gilbert Street to Keokuk Street with a buffered bike lane. Um, the estimate for this project is $90,000. Uh, the bid letting is on October 11th. Uh, the award date is planned for October 18th with a start date of October 31st and completion expected to be in the spring of 2023. Are there any questions? No questions, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? I see no one online, anyone present? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve please? So moved, Weiner. Second, Burgess. Council discussion. Well, a, a couple of these projects, um, Jefferson and Market have bike lanes and uh, this project will buffer them. Uh, they're not currently buffered as I recall. So we, we are making uh, an adjustment there uh, to the, you know, that has a safety advantage. So I'm happy to see that. And as a frequent now bike lane user, I can say that 1.5 feet of buffer makes a huge difference in comfort and safety. So it's a good move. Good. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 12, American Legion Road Speed Limit. Ordinance amending Title IX and Title Motor Vehicles and Traffic. Chapter three entitled Rules of the Road, Section six, entitled Speed Restrictions, Subsection B, entitled Exceptions to Eliminate the 35 mile per hour speed zone for American Legion Road. Can I get a motion for first consideration? So moved, Thomas. Second, Weiner. All right, we're gonna welcome our staff, Jason. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Jason Hobble, City Engineer. Just gonna give you a little bit of background information about the speed limit change item in front of you. On the construction side of things, we're working through the American Legion Road reconstruction project. We're currently on phase two, which goes from Buckingham Lane to Taft Avenue. Uh, Currently, we are focused on the west end of the project and hoping to have the, the first section open probably mid-October, so that would go from Buckingham Lane to Barrington Road. Um, and then this, the remaining section we're hoping to have open yet this year, uh, depending on weather and, and contractor progress, it, it may be this year or uh, spill over into the spring. But you may remember, as part of the design process, we were going through a, for the reconstruction of American Legion Road going from a, an urban, or sorry, from a rural cross section, so that'd be a, a roadway with drainage ditches and converting that to an urban multimodal corridor, which would include design elements such as narrow uh, travel lanes, uh, on-street bicycle facilities, sidewalks, that kind of stuff. Um, as part of that, we also implemented a 25 mile an hour design speed as part of that design. So the item in front of you is kind of the last step in that process, so that will change the speed limit on this section of American Legion Road from 35 miles an hour to 25 miles per hour. Um, the thought is that it would change from, you know, again, from that rural cross section, the 25 mile an hour would better reflect the, the new urban multimodal cross section that we'll have with the new construction. Um, 
this is similar to what was done for phase one of the project, which was west of here from roughly Scott Boulevard to Buckingham Lane. Um, and as far as timing goes, this will allow us, as we open up these sections, to have that 25 mile an hour speed limit in place as those open up. So with that, happy to take any questions. I have a, a couple. Is, so is Jason, is this the same profile as um, I see on Foster Road in terms of the cross, cross section? I don't believe so. I, I think if I remember correctly, I thought Foster Road maybe had 11 foot lanes and this is 10 foot lanes. Uh -huh. Foster Road used to be beautiful. So it's it's uh, 10 foot down. lanes and then the buffered bike lanes. There'll be buffered bike lanes. Are there, are there street trees between lane. the sidewalk and the um, Flowers and herb? butterflies between. Correct, the intent would be to have uh, street trees and sidewalks. You guys wrecked it back then, put a freeway through there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. We're going to open this up for public discussion. Anyone want to, from the public want to address this topic? I see no one online. Anyone present? Seeing no one. Council discussion? It's going to be nice having more and more of that road uh, opening up. So. Absolutely. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 13 is Shelter House Street Outreach Agreement. Resolution ag approving an agreement with oh, Shelter. 7 to 0 on what? What happened? Please do not speak out when it is not public comment time. All right, we are at item number 13, which is Shelter House Street Outreach Agreement. Resolution approving an agreement with Shelter House for Street Outreach Services. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second, Weiner. All right, and we're going to welcome um, any staff comments at this time. Uh, Mayor Captain Denise Brotherton from the Iowa City Police Department is going to start us off on this item. Awesome. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Denise Brotherton with the Iowa City Police Department. It's been a while since I've been up here, uh, but excited to be here to talk about street outreach. Um, it's been in existence for a year, and we are excited to see the continuation of this position. Um, we still often deal with these situations, but uh, we have short-term solutions as the police department, and uh, as our officers try to provide resources and referrals, we still miss that second element of that follow-up and that relationship building, and that's what we see street outreach doing and supporting us and providing a safe environment for everyone in our community, whether they're housed or unhoused, and we just believe that the continued Continuation of this position and this partnership with Shelter House will continue to serve and protect those most vulnerable citizens, our community members in our in our city. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Mayor, we also have uh, Chrissy Canganelli from the Shelter House that was going to provide some background on this item for council as well. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Teague and council members. Thank you for your consideration of this request to continue street outreach in Iowa City for another three years. While the partnership began in February of 2021, street outreach services did not begin until April of 2021. Since that time, we've engaged 155 individuals, 17 of whom were children under 18. The street outreach specialist meets with individuals everywhere from parks and individual encampments to the free lunch program and other area providers to downtown and around town. Referrals are made by the Iowa City Police, other municipal departments, area partner organizations, and private community members. Individuals served are provided survival items including tents, water, food, first aid supplies, sleeping bags, and cold weather gear. Support is offered with local service navigation, mental health and emotional support, transportation, and assistance with applying for, in, in applying for and securing mainstream benefits. And finally, when chosen, housing searches and placements. 
The street outreach specialist regularly works with individuals who are known to use op opioids and have friends who, have, who use, supplying Narcan and training on how to administer it so as to prevent overdoses. Shelter House works to ensure access to clean needles and provides sharp container, sharps containers. Our initial goal is to build trust and engagement with folks who are otherwise not necessarily connected to care. Since April of last year, 84 individuals have been permanently housed and are successfully retaining their housing. Many individuals move directly from the streets of our community into a home. Decades of homelessness ended. Through our collaborative approach, we focus on reducing calls for service to the police and have together avoided a myriad of charges ranging from public intox to trespassing. Many thanks to City Manager Fruin, Chief Liston, Sergeant McKnight and Captain Brotherton, and the staff in public works and park, and park departments whom we work with closely to address the needs of unsheltered individuals and families in our community. The past year has been quite a journey. We've learned, we've leaned in and learned from one another. As with any new initiative involving cross-sector partnerships, we didn't always see eye to eye. We faced challenges, had animated conversations, made some missteps, and worked to repair and course correct. We identified a common ground, those in need of housing and care, the interest and desire to improve public health and safety, the understanding that housing is essential for health and essential for safety for the individual, and that all people are housing ready. Because of this, we have a street outreach model in which other communities across the state look to replicate. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? Not to dig, I'm sorry, not to dig too deep, but what were some of just the challenges um, since this is a new program? Um, you uh, mentioned some of the collaboration, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, yeah, just what were some of the challenges? I'm going to play with your phone, Jeffrey. Yeah, largely where Iowa City police begin and end mm -hmm. and Shelter House Street Outreach can begin and end and that transfer and transition um, where we can prevent situations from escalating, where we work together to make appropriate referrals. Um, so it's really navigating that relationship. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone from the public like to address this topic? I see no one online, anyone present? Seeing no one, council discussion? I think this is an amazing and important first step. I'm so glad that it's extended and I can't wait to see as it matures how um, the collaboration continues and uh, already um, it, the fact of as many people being helped and, and, and 84 permanently housed already is truly amazing. And uh, I can't wait to see how this program flourishes. And uh, yeah, it's amazing, amazing to hear in one year's time, two years time, how long, how, how quickly um, you've gotten your feet on the ground and, and have really stretched out into the community and clearly have gained trust to be able to help people because I know that that's oftentimes um, an important first step is that there's a lack of trust to, to do that. So just awesome. I think the ability and willingness to have those hard conversations and the and the sort of animated conversations and figure out where the boundaries lie and the commitment on, on the part of, of everyone to do that is really key to, to the success of this. Not, not just to sort of say, well, I'm right and you're wrong, but to, to, to work together to resolve that piece. That's really important. Meeting people where they are is what comes to mind when I hear about this. and. Um, the reaching out by the shelter house and all of the other partners, um, I think is significant um, because it really does offer people um, information, resources, and what I would really call it is hope. And so thanks for uh, providing this program. Agree. Roll call, please. 
Burgess? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number 14, the South District SMID operating agreement. Resolution authorizing the mayor to sign and the city clerk to attest an operating agreement between the city of Iowa City and the South District self-supported municipal improvement district. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Alter. Second, second. Taylor. All right, moved by Alter, seconded by Taylor, and we're gonna welcome staff Wendy Ford. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm Wendy Ford, Economic Development Coordinator. This is the final step in establishing the South District Self-Supported Municipal Improvement District, easier said as a SMID district. Um, and this is to adopt an operating agreement which outlines two things. One, how the SMID will carry out its work in accordance with the petition that called for the formation of the SMID and two, how the city will distribute the SMID property tax revenues to the organization. As you recall, last December 21, um, the SMID was created by ordinance and it allowed for the collection of an additional tax assessment on the properties within the established area, which is generally surrounding and including the Pepperwood Plaza. An exact reflection of the petition of property owners to establish the SMID, the operating agreement memorializes the activities the SMID has committed to, which are for administrative and operational expenses of the district as defined and authorized by state law. A board is now established to run the nonprofit and they have just announced the hiring of Angie Jordan as its executive director. And I could answer more questions if you like, but um, I'll leave it there unless you have any others. No questions for you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? We welcome and invite you up front to the, to the mic. I see no one online. I can sit here. <laughs> Good evening, Council. My name is Katie Gerlach. I'm the director of Better Together 2030, and I'm here on behalf of the South District SMID Board to thank you for voting in favor of this operating agreement and taking this last important step. I'll be here later, uh, hopefully this fall, to talk about the Better Together All in Vision Plan, but as you all know, the South District SMID is probably one of the best examples of where our community wants to go over the next seven years. Authentic, vibrant neighborhoods that are, uh, you know, leverage the assets that are unique to each commercial node, but also, as you heard today in the work session, inclusive economic development and how important that is. And the South District SMID will be an incredible leader in that front. So. We hope that you'll support it and look forward to taking the next steps. Great, thank you. Any other comments? All right, council discussion. Thank you, Wendy, for the information and uh, congratulations to the board for uh, hiring Angie Jordan as their director. I, I, I couldn't even imagine a better person for that. She just has so much energy and enthusiasm and hope for the South District. She's just done some amazing things for the South District and, and I'm excited for this. I'm excited for the SMID and I'm excited to see Pepperwood Plaza grow and, and other areas in the South District. So thank you. Great. Second. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, I'll go right ahead. I just was gonna say, I'm just so, so excited to vote for this. I know how hard people have worked. I'm looking at you, Tasha. Um, but no, this is just, it is a great freaking moment and a great accomplishment. And you guys deserve a huge round of applause for the amount of work that you've put in and just kept that vision and got there. So I'm so psyched to vote for you, get, vote this in. Here, here. <laughs> here, here. Well this said. is Agreed. yeah. This is super exciting. I remember when this came before us, um, and this is that final piece. So, I'll be in support of this tonight. And uh, thanks to the board who also um, uh, appointed Angie Jordan uh, as the executive director. So, super excited for that. If nothing else, roll call, please. Harmson. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. 
Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Alter? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 15 is council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. 15A, Housing and Community Development Commission. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment through June 30th, 2025. And council discussion. And this is our only appointment tonight. Um, the requirement is gender uh, to be a male. Um, it sort of makes the choice for us, although yeah. it, fortunately <laughs> also the applicant seems quite qualified. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Michael Eckhart. Yep, we only had one applicant. Um, are people in majority in support? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Could I get a motion to appoint Michael Eckhart to the Housing and Community Development Commission? So moved, Harmson. Second, Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, Burgess. Second, Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item 16 is announcement of, announcement of vacancies new. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Planning and Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment through June 30th, 2023. Applicants Applic application must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Item number 17 is announcements of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Ad hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, September 27th, 2022. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacant city fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, Iowa City Representative, one vacant city fill a six-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacant city fill a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we are at item number 18, which is City Council information. Can we also talk about um, yes. The meetings or whatever boards that we absolutely we didn't. Yes. So I don't. I mean, there, there was a meeting of the, of the ICAD board, which was a useful meeting. With they, they are really showcasing some really exciting young entrepreneurs, as well as this. The, the whole edtech project continues to continues to be um, really productive. Um, and then I just wanted to reference an event that that a couple of us attended, which was the. Um, the anniversary of Title IX luncheon, which um, which featured uh, Coach Bluter as the speaker, and uh, it, it was it was a very a well attended festive event. But what really struck me was her message: uh, What did sports bring to women? Um, I'm not going to be able to recite everything she did, but essentially it brought leadership, it brought teamwork, it brought the ability to um, work together, to be assertive, to rise to other levels in the community um, by dint of the work that the, the young women do together and learn together, and that has been a huge gift to our society. Yes. All right. Other comments? I'll just plug Climate Fest again, starting tomorrow, kickoff at Big Grove at 5 p.m. and activities go through the 24th. Um, so look online at icgov.org for the Climate Fest festivities, which look great. Don't forget the peacefully pick at the farmer's market Saturday from Anything? 7 to 9. I have Hopefully a I won't get beat up by Jeffrey's I have a few. Um, one that was actually, it was wonderful. It was um, the City of Literature uh, had their annual board meeting actually down at the University of Iowa Library where there is um, this wonderful exhibit on the history of the International Writers Program and Paul Engel. Um, so it was amazing to have the meeting there and to be surrounded literally with the artifacts and to have the curators there walking us through. But it is, and it's, 
a very small exhibit, but uh, full of this amazing Iowa City um, literary history. So if anybody wants to go there, it, it, literally you can go through as fast as you want or you can sit and read every note and it's really amazing. Um, so that was a wonderful extra to uh, a board meeting. Um, Additionally, uh, I actually got to sit in on um, a Zoom meeting with a lot of mayors from different municipalities um, on gun violence. And the um, chief speaker was actually the mayor of Highland Park. And so um, it, was in, it was a very powerful message because she said that at the same time, and there was I was just frantically taking notes, and so there are a lot of resources, um, including centers that have templates for resolutions and ordinances and to you know, encourage us to work with our attorneys um, to find out what's possible and what isn't. But additionally, um, her message, to, to go along with what you were talking about, what are the takeaways? Her message is we just cannot um, sugarcoat this, uh, that we have to talk about the horrific cost to people. And she said this is also, quite starkly, she said this is not a matter of if this happens to your community, it's a matter of when. Um, and she said when this happened to us, it was both a shock and a relief and then a shock all over again that there are these like immediate resources of when this happens to your community, here's what you do, Mayor. Um, so it was incredibly powerful, but it, it, and I know that we are actually working towards that as well um, here to, to be more proactive about what we can do as a community uh, to work with law enforcement. But it, it was very clear that it was like this is not a law enforcement solution. It is a community solution. So at any rate, that was incredibly powerful. So I just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. I'd like to add real briefly that both the bivalent booster shots and flu shots are available. You should get them. I got one in each you. arm at the same day. <laughs> I live to tell the tale. I think it, we had a lot of talk tonight about uh, young entrepreneurs, so probably should mention that it's going to be Kids Vendor Day at the Farmer's Market on Saturday morning. So always a, it's always kind of a neat day to, to see all the different crafts and baked goods and all kinds of stuff out there with some of our young people in the community. Friday and Saturday is Soul, Soul and Blues Fest, so I encourage people to go out and have a good time, soulful time. Um, next week, uh, I believe it's Wednesday through Friday, I'll be in Waterloo at the Iowa City League of Cities. Um, and that is always a great opportunity, not only to uh, have discussions with other um, public servants that are uh, mainly city councilors, um, but also opportunity to learn from others and bring some of that information back. So I'm excited about that opportunity. And then I'll just mention that next Thursday, um, the African American Museum of Iowa is doing their History Maker Gala. And um, super excited that our Iowa City's first um, black mayor, Ross Wilburn, will be honored as a history maker. And um, I'll be attending that. So I'll go to Waterloo, come from Waterloo just to attend that and then go back to the conference. But um, super excited to uh, have him honored um, on that day. I apologize for uh, having to look this up, I, but I think you talked about mayors and somebody talked about the literature uh, on uh, next Sunday, October 2nd at uh, 2 p.m. at the Prairie Light, uh, held, hosted by Prairie Lights Bookstore, but it's at the Iowa City Public Library, will be a discussion of former Iowa City Mayor uh, Jim Throgmorton's book, uh, Co-Crafting the Just City, Tales from the Field by a Planning Scholar. And if you haven't seen his book or read any of his books, it's very interesting and a lot, of, a lot of us could relate to it and some of the city staff also, so that should be a good event. All right. If nothing else, we'll go to item number 19, which is a report on items from city staff. Nothing tonight, Mayor. All right, nothing from our city manager's office, our city attorney. Nothing from me either, thank you, Mayor. All right, our city clerk. All right, this is gonna be tricky, but we're gonna, uh, uh, item number 20 <laughs> is, uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? Um, before I do that, I'll just give a heads up as to what I plan to do. So we're gonna adjourn from the formal meeting 
And then we're going to go ahead and do roll call into our executive session and take a 10 minute break at that point. Um, if people want a 10 minute break, mm -hmm. and then we'll go in, and then we'll uh, go into executive session and then come back here after that to end. All right. So number 20, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Alter. Second, Taylor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned.